Hello and welcome to Media Mastery Show. My name is Alden Altenay, your host today, and I have a very special guest with us today. His name is Paul Holzberger, and he is the general manager of IP Wealth. He's been doing that for eight years now. Apart from that, he's been a private investigator over the years, and he also did fraud investigation, among other things, for Queensland Police for 10 years. Hello and welcome, Paul. Hello, Alden. How are you? Very good, thank you. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, now, I've actually had trademarking done with you myself, with my media business, AA Expose Media, and with uh, some of the things I've done. And I must say, I found it very insightful when I first came to see you uh, talking about trademarking and, uh, you know, the stories I'd heard from people is that, oh, you can do it yourself, or it's not that important to get trademarking done. And after coming to see you, I must say, you certainly opened my eyes to why it's important to get trademarking done. So before we get into that though, I'd just love to know your background and how you got into uh, doing what you do and um, what you love about it. Okay, so um, uh, what happened was it around about, I had uh, various business interests. Um, I retired from the police in 2000, um, went on to um, be a commercial agent uh, and a private investigator. Uh, and around about 2008, uh, my lifelong friend, Michael Beverly, um, who founded the company in 2004, asked me to come on board and, um, and give him some assistance. And I've been here ever since. Okay, fantastic. And what are some of the horror stories you've heard in your time doing trademarking and protecting people's online and business assets? Well, probably, probably firstly, I should... I should tell you what or talk about what a trademark is and why it's important to have a trademark and, and then go on to those stories if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Okay. So firstly, people don't get a trademark because they want a certificate to hang on the wall. Um, people get a trademarks for three reasons. The first reason is they don't want to be in business for a month or a year or two years and have somebody turn around and tap them on the shoulder and say, hang on a minute. Here's a cease and desist letter. You're infringing my intellectual property. Um, we want you to rebrand now or we're going to litigate you. And oh, and by the way, uh, we've done due diligence on you and we think you've earned X, Y, Z dollars uh, with our brand and now we want a portion of those profits. The second reason is uh, that when those bottom feeders appear and those copycats, and they will, as soon as you have a, a product uh, or a service or any kind of business that starts to get a bit of traction in the marketplace, you start to get noticed, those bottom feeders will appear. And the problem with that is that quite often they're not as passionate as you are and they're only in it for a short haul. And what happens is they start giving a shoddy product or a shoddy service and that directly impacts on you. They also take a share of your pie away from you. So you need to know if those people appear that you can get rid of them easily. If you don't have a trademark, you've got no hope of getting rid of them. And, not a, and as soon as one of those appears, next minute there's two, three, four, and what was once a very lucrative business becomes, you know, your profits just end up all just vaporizing into, into the air. Um, the third reason is uh, people want to, may want to franchise. Um, you have to have a trademark if you want to franchise. You don't have to have a trademark to license, but our advice is always that if you are going to license, you need a trademark because, you know, if that person turns around in a year's time or two years' time, puts their finger in the air to you, you need to be able to pull all of that back. If, if you don't have a trademark, really you haven't got much to go on. So also the difference, most people don't really know what a trademark is. Um, most Australians that walk through the door here, and we get a couple a week, they've received a cease and desist letter. They've been in business for most of them a couple of years. And the first thing they say is, we've got copyright, or you know, we own our business name. Now, where it becomes confusing is when you apply for a business name or a company name, they say, congratulations, that name is available. And people think, I own that. Well, that's not true. You never own your own business name. You never own a company name. You don't own a domain. These are all temporary licenses. The only thing that you can actually own 
is a trademark. And so long as you're using it as it's meant to be used and you renew it every 10 years, you can continue owning that almost forever. So the other thing about trademarks is most people think that all trademarks are equal, and that's not true either. So let's look at domain names, for example. So I want a domain name. It doesn't matter whether I go to Crazy Domains, Melbourne IT, Net Registry, GoDaddy, or, or any other provider. The prices may vary, but at the end of the day, what you get is a domain. They're all the same. People think trademarks are like that as well, and the problem with that is trademarking is as complex as there are layers in the ocean. So it really takes years of experience to get it right. And I would estimate, and, and look, I look, at, I look at trademarks every day of the week, and I probably anywhere from 50 to 100 trademarks pass my desk. And 80% um, of those trademarks, I mean, they're not our trademarks, they're that people come to us or mostly along those lines, or we're doing searches, so we're looking at, at, at competitors' trademarks, how are we going to get our client in? So most of those trademarks have got more holes in them than Swiss cheese, and by that I mean they haven't covered the proper classes, they haven't covered crossover classes, the specifications don't cover what they're doing. Um, these sort of things, if somebody comes to me and says, Paul, I want to get into this industry, I want to get into this business, here's the name, here's the brand, first thing we're going to look at is somebody else out there with it? Yes, there is. Okay. So are there any backdoors or loopholes? Yes. Quite often there are. And it doesn't matter. Uh, I've seen these backdoors and loopholes with law firms, um, with all kinds of other firms that do trademarks. They just don't, a lot of them don't get it right. So, um, yeah, that's mm -hmm. about it. Very interesting. So the classes you talked about, what's what's an example of, of some okay, classes? Okay, so there? there are 45 classes worldwide, uh, or virtually worldwide. Most of the countries in the world met um, sometime in the past and all agreed that class one here is going to mean the same thing as class one there. So class 25 is clothing. Um, so in, a, in the USA, it's, it's uh, class 25 is clothing. New Zealand, 25 is clothing. Great Britain or the EU is 25 clothing. There are countries that are outside this, but the majority of countries use this system. So everything that you can imagine, doesn't matter what it is, will fall into one of these classes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Some so of these class, and some of these classes cross over. And there are different mm -hmm. rules that are applied to uh, a lot of these classes. For example, class 25, if somebody else... Uh, has got that for that class, even though they haven't covered the specific specifications that you might be doing, for example, you're pretty much locked out. Clothing is one of those hard ones to uh, to get around. Mm, interesting. So how do people know which classes they should be in? How do you work that out with people? Well, what we do is we, we have a discovery session with people uh, and we we determine what they're doing now, where they're going, you know, I mean, it's it's not always straight up and down because do you have downloadable product? Um, are you a service-based business? Um, you know, you might be providing some kind of machinery. Are you? Do you do the repairs as well? See, it's the it's the little things that you don't cover that your competitors are going to use as wiggle room to get into the marketplace as as a competitor for you. Then, and, and once that happens, you can't do anything about it. Mm, so it's best to protect yourself to make sure you're okay. And of course, this is the Media Mastery Show. It's all about how to get your message to the masses. And there's no point getting a message to the masses and getting your branding out there if it's not protected. So would you say that trademarking is the the one of the first things really people should be doing before they do any other marketing? Yep, absolutely. We have a lot of people come to us and say, I've just bought every domain name possible and they've spent a lot of money and then we look and the, the name they want, for example, is descriptive. Somebody else has a name. So we've got to go back to drawing board. The very first thing that people should be doing before they get their business license or their company or their domain is they should be speaking it to either us or somebody on the same skill level and working out, is this the direction that we can go? Because the last thing that you want to do uh, is go down a track and then 
lose it all. I mean, we've had, we, we see a lot of things happen. We had a case a couple of years ago where a, a major accountancy firm who did their own trademark, um, their accountancy services are in one class. You'd think that financial services are in the same class. They're not. So what happened was they, they, they got themselves for accountancy services. They traveled, I think it cost them uh, a lot of money to do this. I think it was, uh, I know the rebrand eventually cost them about $40,000. So they, I, I'm not sure about the initial rebrand. So they went to a branding company. The branding company did a big thing for them. They launched their new brand. A year down the track, they got tapped on the shoulder by a finance company who said, look, we know that you're doing accountancy services. We know you've got the trademark for that. We're happy for you to do accountancy services. But hey, we do financial services. We're not happy for you to provide that service anymore. So they had to rebrand uh, completely because it was ridiculous to be doing accountancy services under one name, but not financial services. So that cost them about $40,000. Now, there's another, um, uh, there's a testimony on our webpage by a guy who had uh, a number of vans. He was in business for about five years. The vans would travel along to your home, fix your car so that you don't have to go to a uh, garage. And someone tapped him on the shoulder. He had no idea about trademarks and uh, had to completely rebrand his business. Because if you get dragged into the common law arena, um, it can cost up to $100,000 uh, to fight this litigation. And at the end of the day, if you don't have a trademark, you haven't got, you know, you haven't got the high ground. So not only are you going to lose your brand, but you're going to lose everything you work for for the past 30 years. So it, it is really important to get to get this right. And I mean, I, I hear people say to me sometimes, look, I've been in business four years. Um, I've never had a problem. Well, four years ago, there wasn't 5,000 trademarks filed in Australia every month. And that number is climbing. So I would I would estimate probably in about two years' time that number will be probably seven to eight thousand. In five years' time, it could be fifteen thousand. Um, in the USA, I think it's around a hundred thousand trademarks a file a month. Yeah. So it, you know, it, if you don't have a trademark and you're in business, you're playing Russian roulette. It may not happen tomorrow. It may not happen next week. It may not happen next year. But sooner or later, the chances are someone's going to tap you on the shoulder and say, you're infringing my intellectual property. Yeah. Oh. And then it all goes it all goes very, very bad. That would be very scary, and particularly if people have got stationery out there and banners and all that sort of thing that they've done with their logos and then find out that they can't use the business name. Uh, Look, I, the hardest, one of the hardest things I, I have to deal with in this job is when we have men come to us with the, with a cease and desist letter and they start crying when you tell them because usually by that time if they've received the cease and desist uh, they don't have a trademark that journey is over there's in 95 percent of cases sometimes we'll find a loophole but generally speaking the journey is over and they will look at me and say but paul i can't this is my life I, i've put everything into this i can't rebrand you imagine if you uh, have spent five years building all this um, all this uh, this tunnel of people to a domain name. You have your domain name taken off you, whether you hand it over because you don't want to be litigated or because someone like us takes that domain name off you. And suddenly, that five years worth of business you've built to that domain name is now going to your competitor or to someone similar. And they're getting all the all the... The rewards from your hard work and you get nothing all because wow. you didn't have a trademark wow that's uh, that's pretty scary and uh, so so what are some other horror stories that you've heard um, or maybe some famous ones out there that uh, we can learn from that uh, have gone wrong for people okay probably a, a good one is something that's happened recently now we file trademarks all over the world every week it, it's, it's very common for us to be filing in uh, China, Singapore, USA, EU, Canada, you know, several times a week for different people. Now, a decision that was handed down recently in China is there's a company, a shoe company called New Balance, and they had the name New Balance in English, but they didn't have it as a trademark in Chinese characters. 
so in Chinese. Um, mm. And the court case came down that because they didn't have it in Chinese characters, that um, uh, that they were infringing um, the person who did have it in Chinese characters. So um, wow. the decision was nineteen million dollars they had to pay. So, oh my goodness! Yeah, so it's fairly substantial. So um, we advise all of our clients now very very strongly to, um, um, although it's a bit more of a cost. It's a small cost, really, compared to you know being litigated, being locked out of China, um, or being locked out of a jurisdiction, and also having to pay big, big bucks. And most most companies just can't deal with that. Um, the other thing is, if, if you are going overseas, the rule of thumb is before you talk to anybody, you get your ducks lined up and you get your intellectual property covered in that country. I mean, we had a, a case last year where a, a very successful boutique uh, uh, organic wine company, who's been one of our clients for a number of years, was talking to a distributor in the UK. Um, and there were three wines in particular that this distributor wanted to carry. And um, he told us that he'd been talking to this particular person. Well, the first thing that we did was we did some searches um, because the warning bells went off, we did some searches in the UK, found that this particular distributor um, had filed all three of his names. Mm. So we were over. We were we were luckily able to catch that very quickly um, and overturn um, those those applications because they were done in bad faith. Um, but a lot of the time, what will happen is somebody overseas will that you've been talking to will will file those trademarks and and try to lock you out. We've had um, a couple of occasions this year alone where um, people have tried to save a few dollars. They found somebody on the ground in China to uh, do a trademark for them. In both circumstances, completely different people, different uh, people on the ground there. Uh, the Chinese associates filed the trademarks in their own names, not in the client's name, and then disappeared. Oh. because what, So they can extort money in the future. We've had a, a distribution company. So all this, this company in China, all it does, it provides the vehicles that take your stock from the shop to the various factories that it's got to go to. This particular company filed uh, the Australian company's name over there in China and then stood over them and said, you're going to use our company for distribution in China exclusively or we're not going to let you trade because we now own the trademark. So wow. we're in the process of that, having that overturned now at the moment as well. But um, I mean, there's, you know, any time you're doing business overseas, you've got to get your ducks lined up. We Usually it doesn't happen for the first year or so. In a lot of cases, we had a, a young um, stay-at-home mother who um, was do, doing designer children's clothing. She hooked into somebody in Singapore Everything was going along famously. She was making $20,000 a month profit after expenses. A year down the track, her trusted distributor filed the trademarks in her own name in Singapore, not in, not in the Australian person's name, and locked her out of Singapore, took one piece of each article of clothing, had it manufactured in China, and this poor woman went from having uh, 20K a month business to having nothing. I mean, she would have had to start again. She would have had to find somebody on the ground. She would have, you know, she just gave up. Mm. Wow, that is really scary. So there's so many scam artists now thinking of all sorts of ways to to make money out of people. It's it's really quite scary. So what are some things that you should look out for then? I mean, for anyone looking to do a trademark, I mean, obviously, the, the main thing is probably get it done locally. I know I feel very safe getting my trademarks done with you because you're, you're just up the road. I can go and see you at any time. I mean, that's, that's a big safety factor for me. Uh, but what other things that people look for when they're looking for someone to do trademarks? How do you know that the company is legit? Okay, so I guess I can speak from our perspective. The difference between us and everybody else is most other people are either a patent firm, so they do patents as their main bread and butter, and they do trademarks as a sideline. Or they're a general practice law firm, so they might do a little bit of litigation, they might do a bit of divorce law, they do the odd will, and they'll do your trademark for you as well if you ask. Whereas we only do one thing, we do 
trademarks. So um, there are a lot of different things that we do in that, but it's all centered around trademarks. So what you want to do is you want to go to an expert. So anytime you're doing something in law, you don't want to go to, if you want a will, go to a lawyer that understands documents. It's all he does. If you're going to get a divorce, heaven forbid, go to a divorce lawyer. Um, if you're going to litigate someone, go to a litigator. You don't want a lawyer or, or an expert working on something for you like this that that is, is uh, you know, does all sorts of things. You just want the expert. So when we deal with people here, and, and, and there are various occasions where we have to work with associates uh, here in Australia and overseas, we, with the associates we work with are all specialised in one specific industry. And it's the same with trademarks. If you're going to have get a trademark, go to someone who only does trademarks. And please don't go to one of those, insert credit card here. Um, we, we like to refer to them as the bottom feeders of the industry. Um, yes, they'll take your money. There's no problem with that. Um, yes, they're cheap. Are you going to get a trademark that, uh, that gets through? Probably not. Um, is it going to protect you? I, I would say most probably not. Um, so I guess if, if, you, if you're in business and you don't have a trademark, you need to get one. If you're thinking about a new project or a new brand, you need to get one. Um, and you need to speak to somebody who knows what they're doing. Don't try to do it yourself um, because a lot of the times you only get so many shots at this and, you know, the chances of somebody jumping in and getting in before you, you know, it happens. I mean, we had, um, we had a guy, uh, CEO of a, a leading Australian company a couple of years ago. Uh, it was just before Christmas and he rang us and told us about his new idea and he had all the stock. It had all been packaged, it had all been shrink wrapped, it was on the pallets, it was ready to roll, it was a few days before Christmas. And I said to him, we need to get this squared away as quickly as possible. And he said, oh no, no, I've got a lot on my plate at the moment, we'll do it as soon as we get back from the Christmas break. Okay, you know, customers always in the driver's seat. So um, we came back uh, a week and a half later, lo and behold, somebody had filed the exact same name in the exact same class and that journey was over. So it cost him a lot of money to, he had to get all the product, um, you know, unshrink wrapped, repackaged, rebranded, everything. Um, it, it happens, you know, it really does. It, you know, it, it's, you know, for us, we, we really care about people here. So, you know, we don't charge in six minute increments. I, I hate that. Um, we don't charge for advice, we don't charge for meetings, we don't charge for phone calls. You know, if someone's got a list of names and, and they're running through and they want to come up with a new name, you know, just ring somebody. If you, Whoever your contact is here, you know, everybody here is the same. So we go, yes, yes, you're on the right track, no, no. I mean, I know that, you know, all the other firms charge for that sort of thing, but what we're about here is long-term relationships and, and, and getting it right for people. So. To give you an idea, um, we we have uh, uh, had a couple of cases where somebody's come to us, like we have a government funded employment agency who, who do employment training, um, and they came to us now. He told me, you know, Paul, uh, the board's just met approval for these for funding for these 15 trademarks. If he'd gone anywhere else, he would have got 15 trademarks. But when I looked at it, I saw he only needed four trademarks to cover everything he wanted. That's what he got. Um, Queensland Guide Dogs is, is a wonderful institution and we, we, uh, we value their custom and um, they wanted, they had a, a brand of wine and um, they wanted three trademarks, it was Paws, P-A-W-S, a very, very clever brand. Um, wine Paws, Dog Paws, uh, I thought that was very nice. Mm. Uh, but when I looked at it, they only needed one, one trademark and that's all they've got, you know, so uh, for that particular brand. So. If they'd gone somewhere else, they would have got three trademarks because that's what everybody else does. But we're about the long-term relationship. We've never advertised. You know, we rely upon um, well, people like yourself and, and other people that are our clients who they might be somewhere at a business meeting or at a barbecue and somebody says, well, who did your trademark? And go and see those people at IP Wealth, you know, and, uh, and, and that's what we rely on. So, 
you know, it's not about churning and burning. You know, I, I would rather turn somebody away and, and not take their money than file something that I know is a definite problem and it's not going to get up. So, yeah, so if you're in business and you don't have a trademark, you know, you need one, you know, and if you think, you know, it's too expensive. The problem is a lot of people, they go, oh, I've, got to, I've got to get this and I've got to get my business license, I've got to get my domains, I've got to get my insurance, I've got to get my stock or I've got to set up the office or whatever it is. Trademark is, is usually the last thing they think about. But if you saw as many problems walk through our door that, you know, now it's all over, um, as we do here, um, you'd definitely be thinking twice. You know, and I'm, I'm sure there's people out there that will probably think, oh, that's not true, and you know, but it happens every day of the week. It's just Russian roulette, yeah. Mm, mm, interesting. So I love the way you, you know, you think long term with clients and that you look after people and you don't just give them a trademark because they think they need it. You know, if, if I, I love how you, you do that and really, you know, trust is the new economy now, I think, with so many scams Absolutely. out there. And I mean, you, you would have seen it as a fraud investigator, no doubt, with the Queensland Police and as a private investigator. You know, how have things been for you in the last, say, 10, 20 years or so uh, that you've been in the industry? Have you seen more and more scams now coming out or, you know, what, what's going on in the world, in the world of scams and fraud, etc.? Well, um, with relation to uh, trademarking, um, with uh, registered trademarks, there is a register that, that people can access. So we've got a lot of these people from the Ukraine and, and uh, the former Yugoslavia and those sort of countries um, that are predominantly, it's predominantly mafia kind of organisations that will will target everybody that has a new trademark, the same as they do for people with domains uh, and business names and all that sort of thing. And they just target everybody, they send them invoices, um, hoping that a number of those invoices will just find their way to uh, the pay clerk and just get paid. And so we, we probably get, oh, we'd have to get about 10 phone calls a week saying, I've just received this invoice, but it doesn't have your name on it. And, uh, you know, what's to go? And I'll send it through to us. And recently, probably in the last 12 months, um, they're getting very, very professional. They've got a, uh, a business in uh, Australia. Um, so, you know, obviously when you look at these things and, you know, the return bank account is somewhere in, you know, Kakistan, you know, it raises the alarm bells. But quite often uh, now, if you see Melbourne, you think, oh, yeah, okay. And uh, and these pay clerks because they're not they're not involved in any of the trademarking decisions or the discussions. They've got no idea. They they just received this invoice to pay, and of course they pay it, and, and the money's gone and vaporised, and they never see that again. Yeah. Mm, yeah. I've, I've actually I've I've personally also received a lot of letters, uh, say from America and different places, saying that I owe money for my annual subscription to a directory I've never absolutely, heard of. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, or, or uh, you know, a, a business name registration or something like that. So there, there's all sorts of offshoots of that same idea. Um, so again, you know, what to look out, what are some things people can do to, to look out for that and to, I guess, advise their pay clerks, uh, you know, that this kind of thing could come through and maybe to run it by them. Uh, I don't know, what, what are your suggestions around that? Well, I think, uh, I think you're going to have some pretty tight, tight, uh, restrictions on what pay clerks can pay. Um, mm -hmm. I think that um, you should have a nominee. If, if you are a company that uh, has a bit of size about you, you should have a nominated person. It's usually the marketing person uh, in these companies. Um, they, you know, anything trademark wise should go through them as a, as a rule of thumb. Uh, and usually in this way, you can stop those things from happening. But, you know, it is very difficult and it is just a numbers game. So. They just don't send a few letters. They'll send, you know, tens of thousands of letters worldwide. And, uh, and, and it's just a numbers game. They're going to get X, Y, Z percentage of people that will pay them. Yeah. Oh. And if people receive these letters, there's like an Australian scam watch. Uh, you should people report report this to, say, the scam watch uh, out there or, you know, what can we do in that way to help um, stop it? Look, um, yeah, all those things help. They all help. I, I think um, just, you know, I think you get a letter like this, 
contact the people who you're going through. You know, ask them, did you send this letter? Can I send this letter to you? You know, so basically what, what happens is when people ring here, and I, I said we get quite a few every week, um, whoever they're speaking to here will say, would you please send that through to us? Yes, do not pay that. Um, that is definitely a scam, and we keep a folder of those here. But they change constantly. Um, you know, it's 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 one of those things. It's very hard to keep a lid on it. You just have to be a little bit uh, savvy. Uh, and I think once you've received one and been told, well, you're gonna you're gonna be very careful. You know about all the rest. But they do catch a few people. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And have you ever uh, been scammed yourself, Paul, with anything? Um, no, no, I, okay. not that I can recall, you know, there may have been, I may have re considered something as a scam if, if I've received very bad service uh, for my money, but no, I can't recall, um, I, I do have a suspicious nature um, and, you know, I've spent a, a decade in the police and, you know, I do notice things that probably other people don't notice. Um, so, but I can't recall ever, ever being, you know, scammed. But bad service, yes. Another one of my pet hates is, is bad service. I, I think, uh, like most people, if there's an expectation that you're going to be treated decently, um, or if you ring a ring somebody, um, you don't want to be spoken to like, you know, hey mate, here you go, and you know, you have an expectation there's going to be a certain level of service. Yeah. Mm, so treat others. As you would like to be treated, they say. Well, and, that's uh, right. That's exactly right. And what comes around goes around. So, uh, you know, often um, uh, those people that don't give good service uh, probably won't be in business for much longer. And that's maybe that's part of the reason why so many biz businesses break down in the first five years. I think it's 80% in the first five years and then 80% in the next five years that, that don't work out. So, you know, small business can be a very challenging thing and there are a lot of different balls to juggle uh, when you're starting in small business. However, really, well, we, we really want to get the message across here how important trademarking is, is, I guess, building a foundation for your business as one of the first things really you should do. Um, apart, well, I guess think of the business name first and then look at trademarking. So it's interesting that we even need a business name really when you think about it. Do we really need a business name or can we just go straight well, to, to the trademark? I think that the main reason that business names have names and company names have names, it, it's so that it's easier to identify really what really is just a bunch of numbers. Okay, so and those numbers are so um, the tax department know where to go to collect money and consumer affairs know where to go if there's a problem. Um, they're the only reasons that those things exist and they put names with them so that they can easily identify. But they are just temporary licenses. Yeah, and, and you are right. New, when, new business, it, it's, it's very hard to, to, to get everything right and, and to survive in that first year or two years. And that's one of the reasons why, I mean, if, if you get to that two year mark, your business is going really good. The last thing you want is somebody turning around and taking it away from you, especially with something that you didn't know existed. So we, uh, a story comes to mind where um, we have a very nice client in Tasmania who has got a cleaning business. Now, this person has got everything set up, almost OCD, it's, it's a, it, everything is right. You, you know, you couldn't get a better service if you had this company clean your premises. So another company called the same name or one letter different in Toowoomba provides a very, very bad service. And they started getting very bad Google reviews. And what was happening was it was affecting his business in Tasmania, a few states away, because everybody thought it was him. Mm. So luckily for him, he had a trademark through us and we were able to remove those other people. Yeah. But you just don't think, I mean, you know, that competitor out there could hurt your business, not because they're taking a slice of your pie, because these people wouldn't have been taking a slice of a pie in Queensland from a cleaner in Tasmania, but they were directly affecting his business because they were doing a bad job and they had the same name. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So with and with Google now, of course, people just Google names and and oh, names the world anywhere. is so yeah, the world is so small, the world mm. is so small. So, you know, 
you've always got to be on alert because it's human nature that you know somebody will be out there who will try to take or or coat along on your coattails the hard work that you've done definitely yeah mm. Mm. Now, I'm, I'm curious about your 10 years with the Queensland Police Service uh, doing fraud investigation. What yeah. sort of, what, what sort of uh, cases did you, did you cover or, or uncover? Um, you know, what, what sort of things did you do there? Um, well, I spent most of my time in plain clothes uh, and I did a lot of drug work and um, I did a lot of fraud work. Um, I can't really discuss specifics there, um, but it, it was a situation where quite often I slept under my desk, and you know, uh, you know, the phone would like helping people. Frauds, when when people get defrauded, they feel they feel gutted. It's like being robbed. Yeah. So you mm -hmm. know, and quite often that fraud is a trusted family person, or it's you know, the trusted employee or it, it, it's somebody that generally you've had some form of relationship with that where there's a trust issue involved. So when the fraud happens, not only are you upset that you've lost your money, that you've been ripped off or, or, or something along those lines has happened, but generally that trust, the trust tunnel has been, has been burned down and People are very upset and, and they want to talk to you. It's a very human side of, of, of what people go through when, uh, when they get defrauded. And um, for me, one of my greatest pleasures was uh, the friendships and the relationships I formed uh, over that time with, with members of the public that, uh, that I was able to help when nobody else would listen to them. So, yeah. Mm. So what are some big lessons there that you could uh, share with people now of, uh, you know, how to beware of fraud? You know, what are some things people can do? What okay. sort of due diligence um, to, to make sure they protect themselves? Okay. Um, obviously, there's a couple of things uh, that, that spring to mind. The employee who never is sick, never has a day. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying... You know, there are a lot of people out there who have very good work ethics um, and, and would probably fit into this model as well. But the ones you want to watch um, are the ones that never have a day off. They do the books. They're, they're the most, they're the last one to leave. Um, the reason they never have a day off is because they don't want anybody looking at what they're doing. They don't want anybody looking at the books while they're gone. They want to be on top of it. Um, if you're in a shop um, and you've got a cash register, uh, money being over. A lot of people look at when there's money under, they think, oh, there's something going on here. But money over is just as dangerous because there's two reasons it could be money over. One, their calculations are out. So they're working out in their head how much they didn't actually put through the till, how much they're going to take at the end of the day. Um, and the other thing is... Um, it's just gone. Mm. Uh, the other thing is they deliberately um, make sure that the money's over so that you don't get suspicious. Oh. Yeah. Um, a lot of people don't, uh, don't when in, in like um, product-based stores, they don't have great uh, accounting procedures because they don't want everything to go through the books. And what can happen is then, because you don't have good stock control, um, that, you know, you're running the risk of people taking advantage of you and stealing from you. And generally what will happen, if you're in a, a, a situation where you've got multiple employees and you're, it's a shop kind of situation, if one person notices somebody else stealing, what will happen is they'll start to steal as well. And then the next oh. person. And pretty, I've had a lot of cases where, you know, there were 30 employees um, and 29 of them were stealing. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's yeah. huge. And not a small amount, a lot. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. So so yeah. that, that could literally bankrupt a business and probably has with lots of businesses. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. 
You wow, know. that's a, that's a really good tip. That's and I've actually heard of some. I, I knew someone who actually ran a um, a Turkish bread shop that had a had a similar experience. That someone actually uh, an internal job where money was being stolen, and it actually did send them send them out of business, which which is very scary. So I've heard those kind of cases. Um, put a camera, so put a camera over the till, and let everybody know it's there. That's a great idea. Mm. Camera over the till, yes, great idea. I mean, it's a shame in one way we need cameras everywhere, but it's almost it's, the world has come to this, hasn't it? Now it seems where you need to just protect yourself and you need to have evidence of you know of theft. You need to have evidence. You know, I've 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 had at my place. I had an uh, I know a neighbour poisoned my tree. He was asking me to chop this big tree down for years, and mm. then suddenly the tree started dying, and I found poison mm. at the base of the tree. Mm. But because I couldn't prove that the neighbour did that. Um, you know, the, the police said, well, there's nothing we can do. We can't prove it. So you really do need cameras everywhere, it seems now, to um, to be able well, I, to... I, th I think the camera is, is, it is more of a deterrent than actually catching somebody. Mm. I think if they know, if they're looking up, they know the camera's there, they're less likely to, uh, to steal. Yeah. Mm. So what sort of cameras uh, do people need? Would you suggest infrared or what, what kind of cameras do you think people need? Oh look, there's there's quite a few. Um, they're everywhere now. You can you can purchase them online. You can purchase them in the shops. Um, I'm pretty sure places like JB Hi-Fi have got that sort of thing as well. Um, you just or, and there's a lot of companies that will install them for you as well. So um, the idea is it, it's not really to catch people. Mm -hmm. um, what you want is to, to, to deter people. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to deter people. So I think I was, I was reading um, an FBI uh, had done a, a report on, on this kind of theft. And they said seven out of ten employees, this is in the USA, and we're very similar to them. So they said seven out of ten employees will steal from you, no questions. So, you know, wow. you give them an opportunity, they will steal. Um, two of the remaining three... Are, are, are pretty honest kind of people, but if they feel wronged by you, so you haven't given them that day off, you might be working them a bit hard, they don't feel they're getting all their benefits. When those sort of situations happen, um, what happens is, just let me fix that, yep. So what happens then is that they will also feel that they have a right to steal. So they cross the boundary then. One person in 10 will find a $10 note on the ground next to the till Pick it up without thinking, put it in the till. Only one, one in ten. One in ten. Wow. According so to the FBI. Yeah. So I mean, I remember that that case, that was a bit extreme where 30 employees and 29 were stealing. The only one that didn't admit um, knew how long the camera had been in the store. So she was a manageress and she didn't admit to stealing. But um, my thoughts are that. You know, things like that can't be so prolific without um, everybody knowing. Yeah. Mm. And it's not just in in business, is it? It's uh, you know, it's like like I, for example, gave a whole lot of money to 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 something actually to a company yeah. that I thought that I was told by a friend or acquaintance, someone I knew, that was going to be returning returning uh, big money back. And you know, four years later, I've still seen no money back for my um, five figure investment in that in that company. And that was someone I knew, so that that was one case. I've had other cases where I've rented uh, properties to people. I've had tenants that have also taken Taken advantage. So, do you have any stats around other kinds of fraud on on, on the number of people that will uh, rip you off that are close to you, uh, not just in business but also in uh, in private affairs? You know, or people that you lend money to that don't pay you back. I hear that kind of story all the time. You know, people say they've lent money and they just never get it back. And now, now the new saying is only lend money that you're prepared to to let go of or only lend money that, uh, I mean, depending who the person is, of course, they're sure there are some people that you really can trust. Uh, however, you know, how much more of this kind of personal fraud, you know, people putting money into investments or, or you know, tenants, for example, that, um, that are taking advantage, they think, oh, you're the owner, you've got lots of money, they'll just, they'll just try and take advantage that way. Um, you know, how much, how much of that kind of uh, fraud are you seeing um, or, or have you seen in your time as well? well when, when I first started uh, in the criminal investigation branch, I was amazed at the cases that we were dealing with where uh, good people, intelligent people, 
were giving away money to, to bad people um, and just totally getting ripped off. And, and I said to this old detective, how do they do it, you know? And he said, Paul, all they do is they make some kind of fantastic offer um, that, that with an even bigger fantastic offer of a return and people fall in hook, line and sinker. Mm. And generally what happens is the first payment, it might seem reasonable, it might be reasonable. My mother is dying, mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. or that's happening. This wonderful scheme, we're going to make all this money. So you tip in a certain amount of money and then, oh, but we're going to need a little bit more now. So you tip a bit more in. You're starting to get a little bit worried at this point, but now you commit it. It might be 15000 it might be 30000 it might be 3000 um, You're kind of committed now. Now you're thinking, I'm really, really worried about this, but if I don't give them more money, I'm definitely going, it's going to go bad and they're not going to want to give me any of my money back. So, and this is what these people rely on. So at the end of the day, you know, there'll be, you know, however many payments for this sort of thing. And, um, and then somewhere you cut your losses. But usually mm. by that time, it's a, a lot of money has passed hands. And, and there's no yeah. shortage of people that will take your money. No shortage. Mm. Well, it's interesting. That's exactly what happened with the case that I'm talking about where I, I put money into something where it was uh, you know, shares in this huge company that was going to, going to come back and be amazing. And if it's that same story has been, has been going for about four years now uh, with, with uh, different stories of why they need more money, you know, to fight different legal cases or yeah, to take, yeah, to take, take yeah. the product elsewhere to another country or, you know, to grow the product so that they can get really get it off the ground. Um, yeah, it's, my, it's... My best advice to, to everybody, to anybody, is trust your gut. You'll get this feeling in the pit of your stomach, stomach that something isn't right. And when you get that feeling, listen to it because it's usually always right. How many times have you heard people say, I just had this feeling, I wish I'd listened to it. Trust your gut instincts. You know, if you do that, you know, people don't like to say no, people don't like to be rude, but honestly, it's the best case, you know, scenario you know, to, to trust your gut and say, no, I'm not interested, or even even if you have to be rude, because the alternative is they're going to take a whole lot of money away from you. I mean, we've had some cases in trademarking where um, some firms in the USA have hooked into people here in Australia and said, we're going to do all your marketing, we're going to do all your branding, we're going to do your trademarks, taking all their money, nothing. Mm. You know, and then they come to us, with a ball of spaghetti to unveil, unravel and it's just usually it's too late. Mm. Wow, wow. And th there's so much of this sort of thing. I actually had Channel 9 out at a story for a client yesterday and I was talking to the reporter there about a big building project that's happened down at the Tweed where the uh, the building is basically falling down. They've used all shonky materials. Um, there's been people that have, you know, one person killed themselves who, who invested in this in this property. Um, you know, people are just depressed, suicidal over what's been happening. They've poured their money into this building and the whole thing is just falling apart and the builder's not taking responsibility. They're saying it's the, mm. the, trades, the mm. tradesman's fault, etc. I mean, this is just one story out of out of so many. Uh, so what are some other things? I guess, you know, do your research on the company. Uh, you know, that would be something. I mean, I look back at my situation where I threw this money at, at this particular pro and there's always an urgency, it seems, to pay the money as well. That's another thing I find with, with scams that I've come across is there's this urgency to pay the money right oh, yeah. now. Sense, miss sense out on of your... urgency. Yeah. Yes, sense yes. of urgency, they call it. Yeah. yeah. And, and looking back now, I wish I did my due diligence. I wish I researched the company. I wish I found out more about what it was about. So what are some other things, you know, people can do when they hear about these amazing opportunities and it's usually to make money quick or something like right. that? Or Usually, if it's too good to be true, it's too good to be true. Okay. That's usually. How many times have I had people come to me and say, I've got this wonderful deal going on. Um, you know, I only have to put a little bit of money in here. It's going to be this massive return. We're all going to be rich. It never happens. If it's too good to be true, it's too good to be true. The other thing is any time that you're dealing with a company you're not sure about, particularly if you're dealing with overseas companies, do a Google um, re review search. So I put a company name in and type the word bad review. 
yeah. then Google will find everything that anyone's typed about uh, in relation to that company and their bad experience. Mm. So you know, that's what I do. And quite often, I mean, these companies, they look so good. I do a lot of business. I've got other business ventures uh, and interests. And I'm dealing with overseas companies all the time. And, you know, one of the things is they, they look good. You know, they, they give you this this feeling, everything's okay here. But as when you do the um, do a Google search on bad reviews, you see that there's just dozens of people who have been ripped off and who are making all sorts of complaints. And that for me is a, you know, stay away zone. Yeah. If mm. I can't well, find a bad review, I think that's okay. Yeah. Mm. Well, this particular company I'm talking about, they've changed their name about three times in the last four yeah. years. Yeah. And I find that that's very another interesting. Warning. <laughs> they heard That's all the legally sign that one. So check all the previous company names and check bad reviews over all the names. Um, and maybe you know, in cases like that, maybe I don't know what can people do. Can they take out some group action? Maybe um, you know what? What do you suggest people do if they have been you know like myself? I've put all this money into this company. I haven't seen a cent back, and I keep getting emails saying, "Oh, we need a little bit more money, and we're offering shares now at this price. You can get it at the bargain bottom, bargain basement price now for yeah, new shares." Right. Well, I haven't, you know, I've had no returns on the shares from four years ago. Why would I put any more money into into this? Uh, so I haven't, and I keep asking, yeah. when am I going to get some money back? Um, so they're still in communication with me, but it's still not going anywhere. So you know, what do you suggest I do in that situation? Come to someone like you and and uh, show um, you what I've got. Well, I mean, I could certainly point you in the right direction. We we uh, specialise in trademarks and. Um, but we would certainly be able to point you in the right direction of where to go. But the thing is, litigation is costly. So, mm -hmm. and, and especially if we're talking about overseas, so you've got to get somebody on the ground. Uh, I'm assuming it was the USA. That's that's where a lot of these things come from. Um, this, was this was a Russian, a Russian manager. Right, Russia, yeah. yeah. Former KGB. <laughs> 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 Businessman extraordinaire. <laughs> but... I think uh, I think you just got to be so cautious. Trust your gut. If it's too good to be true, it's too good to be true. You know, always be suspicious. Always. It it, it doesn't hurt when you. Not in life in general, but when you're about to give somebody money, you know, a little trickle first and see what you get. You know, don't anybody. This anytime somebody says there's a sense of urgency, that that's one of the uh, the scams. You know. It's got to be today. It's got to be quick. We've got to hurry. You know, the, the window is closing. You know, this is just to get you to jump quicker and, and stop the, you know, your gut instinct from cutting in and saying, hang on a minute, something's not right here. Yeah. Yeah, very hard to, yeah, yeah. you know, and they know this. They know it. You know, they know exactly what's going on. They know it's going to be too hard for you to do anything about it. You know, they're never going to stop contacting you because you might give them some more, you know. Mm -hmm. I know you might. Yes, but, yes, you'd be um, the best. Oh, I won't be giving them another cent. <laughs> I won't be giving them a cent. In fact, I think it'd be a great expose story on them, except I just want my money back. And I'm, maybe there's a there's a glimmer of hope that maybe one day I'll get it back. But, um, yeah, I'm not going to give up on it. Let's put it that way. So, uh and you know what comes around goes around at the end of the day. I've certainly learnt a lot from that experience, and I won't be just throwing money at something uh, like that again without doing my due diligence properly. So hopefully, if you're watching this show and and you know hopefully you're learning from this, then that you will check things out and not rush into um, giving money to people. And even like it could be simple things like people ask for a loan of money, or you know you hear that all the time. You know, and so many people just don't get paid. But it could be fifty dollars, a hundred dollars. It might not. You know, a thousand dollars, whatever. It might not be what, a lot of money, but um, well, what what most people don't, I get, honest people don't realize is that the, for these people, it's a business. It's a full time job scamming people. You know, honest people like yourself would would just don't can't conceive that there are people sitting around whose full time occupation is ripping people off every day of the week. Yes. Yes, so question everything. I think your sound just cut out there uh, for a minute, Paul. So, How's um, that? Is that oh, right? there it is. Yeah, it's back in now, back in. So I missed the last thing of what you said just then. Um, what did I say, Claire? Sorry? No, I've totally lost it. Sorry. Okay, that's all right. <laughs> that's all right. Um, 
We're talking about people, just people borrowing uh, bits of money here and there, like even just lending people a little bit of money here or there. Um, yeah. You know, as you said, just just maybe drip feed a little bit of money if you're a bit cautious, and just see what happens with your small the, the small bit of money rather than throwing a large amount at something. Um, but you know, I, perhaps do you do do your due diligence before you give any any money to anyone, um, because well, you know, quite often quite often it's very hard to to deal with reputable companies. You know, trust your gut instinct. Is something off here? Are you getting a feeling that something's off? It it probably really is. Um, deal with companies that have been around for a while. You know, if, if it's a, you can't find anything on the internet, they got no digital footprint, um, they got bad reviews, you know, these are all things that, that are indicators that there's something not right here. You know, so there are, if, if you do be a bit cautious, um, you trust your gut instincts, you know, you will you know, some, something will just tell you this isn't good, there's something not right here. And um, most people, if they follow that, they'll be right. I mean, there's always, there's always very, very good scam artists that go to great detail to, to make sure, to show you everything's okay here. Um, you know, it's a full-time job. You just gotta hope you don't come across too many of those people in your life. Mm, mm. That's what you were saying before, actually, that these people do it for a living. They're expert at scamming people and, you know, more and more this kind of thing is coming out. So definitely be wary. And when it comes to trademarking, of course, there's a, there's a lot of shonky organisations out there. So if you can just remind viewers here, we did talk about it earlier in the show, mm. but just as we're, as we're about to wrap up, what things to look for in a trademarking organisation or some, someone to get your trademark done with to make sure that you get it done properly and don't get ripped off um, by a company in that area? Well, I, w I would say um, you want somebody that absolutely specialises in, in the one thing that you're looking for. So <clears throat> if it is trademarks that you're looking for, go to a firm that has real people in it. Um, maybe they got, like us, we've got ex-government examiners working on staff. Um, you can contact these people by telephone, you know, if you want to, you can meet with these people. Um, they just, you know, a lot of websites where it's just insert credit card here, that's a danger sign to look out for. Um, but I, I, uh, I really recommend anybody that's in business, um, please do yourself a favor and, and get yourself a trademark, um, but get yourself a proper trademark. Don't try to do it yourself. Don't go through somebody shonky that, you know, hasn't got your best interests at heart. You know, this is your lifeblood. You you wouldn't drive a new car off the block and drive around in it for two weeks without at least a cover note. You wouldn't go away for a month's holiday without making sure that your home insurance is up to date. This, this is your business insurance. This is what puts bread and butter on the table. It doesn't matter whether you're a, 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 a partnership, a sole operator, or a big, you know, multinational corporation. We look after, you know, well over 2,000 of Australia, uh, two, we've got thousands of clients. We've got well over 100 of Australia's leading brands, you know, but we also have little people as well, and everybody gets the same level of service and respect. That's, that's very, very important. So um, if, if any of your viewers um, would like to talk to us, we will have a discovery session with them for free and we'll even give them a free search valued to uh, $800, yeah. Fantastic. That's great, Paul. It's really been an absolute pleasure to chat with you today. We are coming to the end of our show. Are there any other final words? What about how can people get in touch with you? Uh, what's your website? Okay, so our website is uh, www. Uh, dot IP wealth that's I for India P for Papa uh, wealth for money dot com dot au um, and our general number here is one eight hundred eight five seven zero seven zero and um, you know we've got quite a team here but uh, if you go to our website and have a look at everybody with little videos on our website where you can get to know the team but if anybody would like to uh, contact me directly that's fine as well. Yeah, fantastic. And the discovery session is well worth doing. Thank you so much for offering that free to our viewers. So make sure when you call IP Wealth on that number again, please, Paul. Uh, 1800 85 70 70. 
fantastic. So make sure when you call IP Wealth, mention that you saw Paul on the Media Mastery Show and it is fantastic to sit down and I felt very comfortable and I feel very comfortable having my trademarks with you and knowing that I'm with experts in the business and that you are going to look after me and you have looked after me and you've been great to deal with. So I can highly recommend my your pleasure. services to everyone who's watching this. And uh, any other final words, Paul? Uh, not really, no, sorry. <laughs> um, just, just um, you know, honestly, if you're in business, you know, and you don't have a trademark, you are playing Russian roulette. It's, it's one of those things, it's so important. And, uh, you know, it's your business, it's your, it's the, it, it pays for your mortgage. It pays for the petrol in your car. You know, take care of it. Mm, yes, absolutely. Make sure you get your trademarks done properly. Contact IP Wealth, ipwealth.com.au, and their number is also on their website. I would imagine. Is that right, Paul? Your number's on your website. That, you is, can... that is that is correct. But there's also a lot of there's some videos there and some testimonials of people um, who who didn't realise what a trademark was and it was too late. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Look, thank you so much for your time, Paul. It really has been fantastic to have you on the show. You're very and, welcome. And uh, for all of those watching, everyone watching this, thank you so much for joining us. And if you like what you see, please like and comment on this video on YouTube. Uh, share it on your social media, help get the word out there. And uh, we would love any comments, any questions you have from the show, please pop it under this YouTube video uh, on Alden Alternate channel on YouTube, this is Media Mastery Show, where it's also on Facebook. Media Mastery Show on Facebook, and you can see the replay there and make any comments on the video there as well. And I'd love you to connect with me personally on any of the social media. Just Google Aldwin Alternay, and you will find me on all the so all the main social media. I'm on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Google Plus, YouTube, Pinterest, and Instagram. All the main most social media, you can catch me there. And uh, look forward to further Media Mastery shows. Love you to join us. Thanks so much for being with us today. Thanks once again, Paul, and we look look forward forward to seeing you again very soon. Bye for now. Lovely. Thank you. Bye bye now. Thanks Paul. Bye.